Last month, Rebel Wisdom put out a series of films with the integral philosopher Ken Wilber. Jamie Wheel is recognised as one of the world's leading experts on peak performance and transformation, as the head of the Flow Genome Project and author of the Pulitzer Prize nominated Stealing Fire. He has a long history with integral theory, going back two decades, and worked for one of the only two integral management consulting firms attempting to bring the principles to business leaders. He reflects on the legacy of integral. It seems to be the case as we move into these you know, nominally transpersonal communities is that all of the thought leaders who have been breaking trail, right, they've, they've, brought, they've brought through something profound, something unique, something useful. They're bringing a tool to our shared collective and by default and or by design, we're all wounded healers. We all need the thing that we've built more than anybody else needs it. And I think that that same case is probably true for Ken. And rather than having the people who have experienced and benefited from integral theory then rise up in some sort of unreconciled, slay the father, angry child dynamic, can there be instead the sense of, hey, wow, your life's work has lit things up in me, has helped guide my path, right, has brought me to places I never had imagined and perhaps can we then turn around and give back the wounded healer the realized gift that they offered in the first place. And not needs to not, no need to knock them down off pedestals and no need to kind of reclaim our gold in kind of angry and dysfunctional ways, but to say thank you so much and let us return the favor, let us return academic acknowledgement, let us return community, let us return love, appreciation, affection, and challenge. Let us show up as the humans you've been writing about all along, and let's help you take that final step for yourself. We don't all need all of our teachers to be Moses, leading people to the promised land and getting stuck on the edge. We can actually welcome the folks that help guide us to that land, to, to the party itself. So Jamie, great to speak to you again from Texas. Sure. We recently put out a film with Ken Wilber, uh, looking at Jordan Peterson and the intellectual dark web and what I think is a really important piece. Like I, I've been certainly very influenced by Integral and think that the developmental framework has a lot to add to this emergent conversation that Jordan Peterson has helped to kind of spark the intellectual dark web as part of it. And I'm, I know that you've got a background with the integral community and you're also one of the most uh, inspiring thinkers that we've met in the time that we've been doing this. I was really impressed with the pieces that we put out with you um, and I think you're holding a really key piece. So I want, and I, I'm fascinated that you have a history with integral as well. I wonder if you might want to sort of go through that for us. Sure. I mean, I think I was, I was actually teaching at a boarding school in California right after grad school. So I was in my early 20s and the headmaster gave me Ken's brief history of everything and said, you might want to read this. And, and, I, and I jumped into it and found that his descriptions of upper stages of development and in particular, I think he talked about uh, the aftershocks of ego death experiences and the little ghosts that come back afterwards. And I remember it was such a lifesaver for me at the time uh, and then dived in that book. And I think it was probably the densest thing I'd ever read for fun, you know, not actually assigned. And that really opened my opened my eyes and opened my world to everything from uh, a validation of interior experiences to the notion of adult development and vertical development and the sort of sense that we don't just stop at puberty or stop you know, in our 20s and, uh, and found it immensely valuable uh, as an initial kind of orienting framework uh, and then even sort of virus scan on thinking and making sense of things. And then you went a bit more deeply into it as well, I think. We did. Um, we were, you know, educators by, you know, um, I was sort of historian anthropologist by academic training, and then was working deeply in 
basically developmentally informed education, ranging from Montessori to Knowles, which is sort of like an outward bound kind of version of, you know, how do you take people into expeditionary environments and, and learn and train, and then played a role with the integral education community, standing that up, which was a kind of a subset or a branch of Ken's Integral Institute in the kind of early 2000s. And then as a result of that work was actually recruited by one of only two sort of truly integral management consulting firms uh, and then went into the corporate space uh, along with John Mackey who was the founder of Whole Foods who set, started the conscious capitalism movement and we worked within the Young Presidents Organization which is a global organization of business leaders that's very it's quite powerful they control about nine trillion dollars in global market cap and we conducted a series of experiments over the better part of a decade on how do you bring integrally and formed development, leadership, organization, and communication into high growth businesses and help the capitalists become a little more conscious. So it's been a, a wild ride and, and a fun experiment. Yeah, because I, I guess the, the interesting thing about both Jordan Peterson and the intellectual dark web in this kind of networked conversation is that it's, it's, kind of open to fit it's, it's in the new digital age so it's got to be open to feedback it's got to be open to evolution and that's I guess what I'm really interested in in being part of that because I think Integral has a really interesting and valuable point to bring but there are also I'm sure lessons that can be learned of integral successes and integrals failures because there was a huge high point of it probably in the, the 90s and 2000s and the question is whether it had the impact that it, that it should have had or could have had, and also what we can learn from it if we're involved in some of the same questions now. And I, I guess you've, you've had a lot of experience right at the sharp end of that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it does feel, uh, there's a couple of things. It feels like a number of the thought leaders today, and whether that's in the crypto space and thinking about kind of decentralized organizations or whether it's in existential risk or even kind of in more sophisticated versions of personal development and, and leadership development, um, I have noticed that even without teasing it out or calling it out, it kind of bubbles up in conversations that a significant number of those folks um, took on and can seriously considered integral frameworks at some point earlier in their life. So I think that's just kind of interesting to note. Um, equally interesting to note, no one is branding their work, their movement or ideas in that way these days. And so that's just kind of a, you know, a, a curiosity, but I think also a full hat tip uh, to the, the ongoing significance of that sort of integral institute diaspora. You know, I think it was sort of a Schumpeter's creative destruction writ large, where an awful lot of fascinating people were drawn together around that movement. When it imploded, exploded, depending on your, your point of view, um, it, it scattered and dispersed a lot of those people, but the relationships and the shared ideas have persisted and borne a lot of fruit. Yeah, you said uh, what I thought was a really beautiful metaphor that a lot of people breaking trail are running an integral OS. Yeah, and, and I think some of the simplest thing is A, the complexity of thinking in those ways, the valuing that there are interior experiences that are as important to map and track as exterior experiences, and that things that we might talk about in the realms of policy, government, business, um, uh, you know, AKA sort of third person structures are also informed by and connected to culture and interior psychology. And just that ability, I mean, fundamentally, the four quadrants of Ken's model, there's insides and outsides of singulars and plurals, um, that alone, I think, is game changing. Uh, and then a few others of, you know, uh, what Ken calls the pre-trans fallacy of like, don't confuse irrational things with post-rational things. And particularly, you know, the terrain that we wrote about in Stealing Fire, talking about the psychedelic renaissance, the explosion in state-seeking and non-ordinary states like Wim Hof and breathing, you name it, really, this kind of immense hunger these days for all things non-ordinary um, is really important to distinguish between what is regressive and just going back to kind of magical thinking and what is progressive where we're truly stepping into some increasingly complex and helpful uh, new ways of looking at stuff. And you mentioned a few there but what do you think are the, are the really crucial pieces that 
Integral provides? What are the, what are the most important parts of that Integral OS? I think I just named them really. I mean, I think it's the idea of interiors and exteriors, and they're they're equally important to be considered. Um, that notion of the pre-trans fallacy: don't confuse um, less sophisticated things for more sophisticated things simply because they're not standard business as usual. Um, the notions of adult development or vertical development were both. I think they were helpfully wrong is the simplest way to say it. And I was actually just having a conversation with Zach Stein, who studied at Harvard, uh, did his doctorate under Bob Keegan and some of the other developmental theorists. And you know Ken's model, which he then kind of piggybacked to spiral dynamics and those kinds of things, the idea that there's such a thing as second tier, that second tier is this momentous leap, that if you're even here at this conference or reading this book, AKA one of us, you are parenthesis, at least cognitively, at second tier. I think that created far more problems than it solved. Uh, and it basically was like crack for Asperger's kids. You know, the idea of getting a contact high from reading Ken's stuff and getting to see yourself on a map and position yourself up and away from, um, no matter what the disclaimers were, and there were plenty of disclaimers, the reality as that showed up in culture and in practice resulted in a bunch of dissociated eggheads masquerading as, as Jedi and thinking that they could solve the world from the position of a whiteboard. And that, I think, was you know, part of the cracks in the foundation. I guess I was relatively late to, um, to discovering Ken's work, and I've been very impressed with it. But I, but I also get a sense, like a lot of integral forums or integral conversations just tend to degenerate into, I'm more integral than you the sort of integral one up developmental one upmanship yeah and and that was what was sort of pernicious about it you know within the integral kind of core community you know ken talking about things that were aqua kosher you know on the one hand totally get it a rigorous rigorous methodology you want to make sure people aren't cutting corners or sloppily applying it but that rigidity then led to effectively aqua maoism where the only things that got the stamp of approval were some of the most derivative unimaginative, like let me take the discipline or vertical I'm a part of, let me run it through the aqua sausage grinder, spit out all the, you know, the expected truisms and critiques, and I've added nothing of substance to my field, but I've just complied with the certification on the top. And, and I think there were only a handful of people that I was aware of. Sean Hoggins was one, Zach Stein was another. There were the number of people who were actually creating unique or interesting content within the aqua world outside of Ken was very low. Uh, and I think part of that was the, you know, this is pre-blockchain, pre-emphasis on decentralized, decentralized sense-making or collective intelligence. So it was very hierarchically throttled. Uh, and I think that choked a lot of the potential messy but essential life that's now happened since um, outside the walls of that closed, closed container. And is that because eventually many people f kind of confuse the map for the territory. So you just end up loading it, you end up having to produce it in a certain language and a certain um, set of dogmas that then crushes the life out of the emergent phenomenon, or what is it? Well, I think, I think your description of, of what happened it was yes, that it for sure became a relatively lifeless regurgitation of, of kind of just compliance on the models, um, which was too bad because ideally those models kind of can crack open places that are stuck in a field or a discipline and then, and then allow new shoots to grow. Um, the map not being the territory was just one of the grandest ironies of the integral movement because it was parroted all the time by the people who are 100% obsessed with the map and not getting outside and roaming around. And so that was another thing is it felt like there was a, a very strong bifurcation of the people who were drawn to the integral movement. And on the one hand, much smaller number, but essential to the life of the movement, were people who were actually arguably already awake or realized themselves in the sense that they were living in the territory. And, and then there were all 
all the sort of late majority of the people who were drawn by the contact high of Ken's writings and the methodology itself. And because of Ken's broad sweep, because of his synthetic analysis of a lot of disciplines, all of those, and, and because of the sort of confidence bordering on hubris with which he held forth and proclaimed the nature of things, if somebody hadn't done their own primary research and wasn't deeply versed in the disciplines that he was presuming to speak of, they took his, his synthesis and analysis as gospel and never went back and did the hard work of reading the original sources and drawing their own opinions or triangulating between other experts and leaders in those given disciplines. But the folks that felt like they were walking the territory, like I don't, I'm not sure Integral actually woke anybody up. So point one, you know, in the same way the critique of Christ as he made Christians, not Christ, Buddha made Buddhists, not Buddhas, you know, the, 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 in Bruce Lee didn't make another Bruce Lee. So the lineage is a son of a bitch. Um, but the people that I experienced and valued the most who were alight with their own lived experience came from what I could tell from the Adi Da lineage. There was a bunch of those, uh, including Sophia Diaz, David D Data, some of, some of those folks, Terry Patton. There were, there were folks that had clearly been lit up by a transmitter in the past. Um, Chogim Trungpa was another lineage source where people were drawn to this work but had, had been sparked previously. Um, Potentially some Osho, although I didn't have one-on-one -on -one direct recognition of those folks in the mix. Um, and that was my sense, is that the people who were already awake got there some by other means, and then were drawn to that work post facto to explain their own lived experience. And the people who were drawn to it purely from the intellectual line or domain, um, it simply entrenched them even further in hypercognition and disembodiment, then it set them free. Yeah, because I, I feel, I mean, when I introduced you at the beginning, I said I thought you were holding a really important piece. And that from reading Stealing Fire and spending a, a little bit of time with you, I think is that embodied flow state, get out of your minds, get into the, the liminal experience, which is something I really identify with, with the piece that you're bringing. And that's the piece you say that was not present with Integral. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've all got our biases, so we for sure, you know, we can only become more of what we are. He was a Eastern non-dual meditator, so out of all traditions, he wildly privileged those. Um, and he was a weightlifter bodybuilder, <laughs> you know, so, so that became his triangle of proving it to academia, um, Eastern and particularly, you know, Dzogchen and some varying other fairly esoteric spaces saying that those were the pinnacle of the Eastern contemplative track and there is nothing but non-dual suchness. And then like, I'm yoked, you know, and this is, this is embodiment. And so those just became, you know, we all come in through certain doorways, um, but as he, justified those to the exclusion of other things, um, I think that's when his, his laser beams became a little tunnel focused. I mean, one classic example is I remember him dismissing the entire Burning Man culture and movement as deep red, which in the terminology of spiral dynamics was kind of very primitive and tribal. Um, so very, very low down the ladder of what could be cool and, you know, six or seven steps below second tier or integral, the, the, the domain that he and his community were claiming. And the reality was that he hadn't been and he had done it by reading the 10 principles right that time, maybe there were six or seven, but what he you know, completely just missed in that assessment was those were lowest common denominator rules upon which a full rainbow of, of, dis of descriptions and, and expressions were also taking place. Um, so it was that kind of, you know, when all you got to hammer everything looks like a nail, when all you've got is a hyper cognitive complex map that dissects things, um, all you've got are parts and pieces. Um, even if there's something vibrant that's not in your personal preference, but might be an emerging thing of interest to keep tabs on. Do you think that the, the developmental piece, and in particular the, the kind of color-based value systems piece, is useful to get out of the culture war dynamic? Mm, I mean, just like an understanding of those different mimetic value systems and how they interact, perceive each other, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is I think that, you know, 
Um, spiral dynamics sort of firmly jump the shark when Ken changed the colors to align with the chakras. Um, that would be the place I would back it off from. And while you're at it, you might as well leave Don Graves behind and go all the way, uh, Don Beck, and go all the way back to Claire Graves. If you want an understanding of spiral dynamics, it lost all of its nuance and most of its usefulness by the time it got simplified into the versions that most people are conversant with today. Um, so that said, you know, back to you know, hard lessons learned from the field. In the management consulting space, we initially introduced spiral dynamics, levels of development, and of course, every hyper agentic, peak orange business achiever, you know, type A personality, instantly looks at any map, model, or ranking system and sees themselves at the top and either insists they already are there or wants to get there as soon as fucking possible. And so after several years of spectacular wipeouts and organizational shit shows as a result of introducing that, we actually deliberately broke the ladder and then rearranged the colors and laid them out horizontally and said, these are different mindsets or worldviews. Here's how you message those different mindsets and do so with basically equal embrace of all the humans and humanity contained therein. So um, the challenge with any of these vertical models is good old fashioned human nature. It's Dr. Seuss and Yertle the turtle. You know, I want to be king of the palm, so stack me up as high as I can go on the backs of all the other turtles. And, you know, arguably the only people that can really hold a hierarchic ranking system and not succumb to egoic bypassing are the people who no longer need it or, or you know or have deeply embodied it already. So as far as Ken's Ken's discussion of the mean green meme, I mean I think it's I think his cultural analysis of pathological baby boomer value systems is spot on and weirdly I thought there was a bullet in that son of a bitch in the, in the early to mid 90s. I thought like postmodernism had officially crawled up its own asshole and died. And that was the time I was in graduate school in the social sciences. You know, we kind of ran that sucker off the cliff. But what's interesting is that millennials are now reviving what Ken calls boomeritis or the mean green meme. And what is even more problematic about the millennials cut at it is they didn't even build it in the first place. They just inherited it. And so they don't even know what it was built in opposition to, AKA 1950s, 1960s, class warfare, militarization, gender emergence, social awakening, etc. They just take it as their birthright of the way things should be. So weirdly, I thought that Ken was fighting the last war on, on kind of on boomeritis or the mean green meme. It has come back like a zombie um, and is now completely infecting social justice warrior kind of stuff and the far left reactionary movements these days. That said, from the developmental perspective, I think, and, and this is not normally what Ken did, um, but I think his, his discussion of green in all of those caricatured pathological ways. It's not in keeping with the rest of the academic literature on individualist, the individualist stage, which is what some of the um, Jane Levenger and Suzanne Groyter and others who were the actual academics in this field looked at. And the individualist stage, AKA green, is actually much more comprehensive and has lots of pro-social and overall positive capacities and developments. And I feel like in Ken's labeling it of MGM, mean green meme, boomeritis, whatever you want to call it, that a lot of that got eclipsed, not just in his own critique and analysis, but in an awful lot of people following him. And so I think that was problematic. Now, that said, um, are things like alt-right and far-left culture wars that are happening today, can, you know, can we gain some insights from looking at the lenses or colors of cultural you know, mimetics? Yes. Does it give us any powerful or profound insights as to what to do about it? Not, not as sure. And what else did you learn from trying to, I guess, enact integral theory at the hard, at the, at the sharp end? Well, the simplest is just no one gives a shit, right? I mean, you, you can be as clever as you want and business leaders, any, any, anybody in actual life, whether it's here's the 17 different levels of parenting and how to bring your little child, you know, people want to know how do I keep my baby who's colicky crying through the night, how do I get them to sleep? And when you bring it into a business situation, I mean, we, <clears throat> we brought some of the most comprehensive, fully dimensioned, aqual, kosher, 
approaches into businesses and quite often even had the you know fully drank the kool-aid buy-in of the ceos slash founders so we had carte blanche in a way that you never do in bigger companies or coming in through hr to do a training like we had massive permission to play and we did everything from Body, bodily stuff to communication practices to maps and models to theories. I mean, just did it all and destroyed shareholder value. Wasted so much time. Ended up, you know, blowing out the backs of those engagements a year later, 18 months later, because we were costing a ton of money and taking a ton of time enforcing, like enforcing that people develop, grow up, take on tools and models that had no clear relevance to their business, their work, or their lives. And no one could handle that much change while still doing their day jobs. So as a result of that, like we kept on pruning and simplifying and pruning and simplifying till five years later, we, we didn't even talk about the quadrants, the simplest element of Ken's stuff. We just simply talked about, and we didn't, then, then we reduced the four to the three. We called it the I, the we, and the it, then realized that was even too abstract. And we called it individuals, teams, and organizations. So like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, you know, we had to go all the way through integral complexity to come back to using terms that were pretty self-evident. There's employees, there's groups of employees, and there's all of us together in this company we run and work in. And so by the time you could break it down to terms that were actionable and useful in the real world as people actually lived and worked in the real world, you're back to truisms and, and really kind of self-evident <laughs> common sense things, which is fine, um, but there was 10 years there where, um, and Fred Kaufman was another one, he, he founded a company called Axialent. Um, none of them worked, and, and neither did I, Integral Institute, as a business. And that's not to say that you know, money and profits are the sole thing, but if one of the truth claims is this model or theory is more sophisticated, complex, and inclusive, therefore more effective, and organizations like the UN ought to be adopting it to solve the problems of the world, and you can't even create a cash flow positive business out of it, that should be a signal that something's not quite right uh, in what's going on. And how would you summarize that not quite right? Well, I mean, again, I think you know, that notion of like crack for Asperger's kids is just too clever for its own fucking good. Um, and that's not to say that certain clever people want to think in that way or write in that way or even read, read things written in that way. Um, but it is to have some humility of the sort of everybody's got a plan until they get hit. You know, Mike Tyson 101. Uh, and it was, it was almost the equivalent of, you know, like in Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, Indiana Jones goes out into that Moroccan square and there's that black Saracen and he whips out his scimitar and does all this fancy ass stuff. And then, the, you know, Indy just picks out his gun and shoots him. Right, and, and that's kind of life. And you know, Aqual Theory was a little bit like the dude with the scimitar, which is an awful lot of arm waving um, without nearly enough um, practical grounded connection to the task at hand. And do you have any other criticisms or thoughts about it? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's been lots of solid and methodical breakdowns of, you know, where integral theory got out over its skis, specifically its orienting generalizations and, you know, presuming to define entire academic disciplines with a certain straw man that then would get knocked down. I think Ken was clearly strongest in the realm of developmental psychology and Eastern contemplative traditions. And, that, and, that's, and that's his earlier work for the most part. And it's, you know, that's where I think he was really drawing from his wheelhouse. Um, the, so there's critiques there kind of within the, within the frameworks, uh, and that's been done. But the biggest one, the biggest two for me, was simply the notion of it didn't work as a business, nor did any other businesses um, uh, find ways to make it work. So just pure proof of concept, product market fit. Um, and the other one, which I think is as big, is one of Integral's biggest, you know, true claims to fame was that Eastern contemplative traditions are partial because they don't address psychological shadow. Western psychological traditions don't address non-dualness or, or sort of attainment. And integral is the best of both worlds because we have non-dualness with awareness of shadow. And then Ken promptly went on to endorse every fucked up dysfunctional guru um, on the planet 
pretty much. I mean, I'm, I mean, maybe this was our field, so we certainly knew these ones, but everyone from not backing away from Adi Da to backing and co-leading everything under the sun with Andrew Cohen, to Mark Gaffney, to Gempo Roshi, to Robert Augustus Market Masters. I mean, the list was pretty much endless as to the, the gurus with feats of clay. And, and that's problematic, because if the very thing we said we could do we consistently, spectacularly fail at ourselves. To say nothing of Ken himself and the blind spots of the single, you know, the hero with a thousand helpers business model. Um, if it's not helping us do the very thing we claim it does better than anything else, um, that's a problem. Why do you think that happened, that specifically? Um, I mean, obviously it's the humans involved. Um, and, and on some level, is there some mutual back scratching as peers and colleagues um, agree to, com to be complicit together on each other's platforms to further increase their reach and scope and you know, business and incomes? For sure. And that happens even more these days with Instagram likes and podcast reach and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's many times that people will look the other way um, for small things and large um, because of reach and scope and mutual benefit. Um, but I think fundamentally it's, it's, it was hubris and, and anybody that proclaims a model of everything is going to miss something and the something doesn't show up on that map. And it's fundamentally, um, I mean, for me, my sense would be is anything that presumes a um, pinnacle attainment, the moment, you know, the moment a teacher hints implies or outright states that they have achieved a zone of realization uh, that is extraordinary versus, you know, I think that, that you set yourself up for the bifurcation and the accumulation of shadow. It seems, I mean, you, you basically just hinted at that there, like this, this Eastern model of enlightenment as a kind of final destination just seems to be is that the problem? Because it seems that as soon as any person or organization is built around that model, it just almost invariably seems to end up in um, shadow. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's one of the biggest problems um, in the sort of spiritual marketplace in general. And whether it's Byron Katie, Eckhart Tolle, Jed McKenna, any of the kind of like crypto neo Vedanta, you know, the idea that kind of like the world is illusory, it's all in your mind, um, and just changing your mind is going to change everything. And, and often smuggled in together with that is something along the lines of there is such a thing as instantaneous, irreversible enlightenment. And I think whether or not there are humans on the planet at any point in time that have achieved something like that, um, is a whole other question. But I think it's a shitty teaching technique regardless. And so, because what happens is the moment a person in the position of authority has claimed irreversible state of perfectibility, then all shadow that arises in the intersubjective, the conversations and the living between you and me, is now no longer me and it has to all be you. And then even when there's clearly some stuff I'm doing that's batshit crazy out of line, I can't go, hey, you're right, I had a bad day. I have to hold behind that plexiglass wall and say, I must, I'm still perfect, therefore I did that on purpose. Therefore, even though it seemed like a shitty thing, it's actually crazy wisdom in service of your awakening. And therein, that's the beginning of the end. And so every time I come across any teacher or teaching that is making any claims along those lines, you're like, don't go near it. No matter how alive a light is shining, no matter how much they're waking people up with charismatic transmission, it just feels problematic. And so that's why teachers like Pema Chodron, you know, who emphasize our humanity. You know, I mean, I think in a nutshell, I think spirituality is wildly overrated. And I think our core humanity is wildly underrated. And so the teachers that I can get behind are the ones, Pema Chodron, Alice Walker, as, you know, as just a wisdom holder, Adya Shanti, like folks who are like, yeah, this is it. This is us. And, and get used to it. And the way out is through. The way out is down and in, not up and away. 
um, those those experiences just feel more honest to me, and we don't end up in the schizoid effort to reconcile the the, the utter tragedy right, that is the human experience with all of these ascendant so-called spiritual states or, or experiences. Do you think, I'm, I'm guessing the answer might well be no, but do you think that integral has some relevance or could, could still be relevant to the conversation today? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. In, in some respects, um, the advice I always give folks is I think that integral theory should be deeply studied and then promptly forgotten. You know, like keep it as kind of operating system virus scan, keep it as kind of uh, pegs to hang things on, uh, keep it, you know, use it as a sort of rubric against which you check to make sure you're not missing something obvious. Um, but in general, the, I, I just don't think that life submits to that form of false precision very well or helpfully. Um, it does feel like, um, in fact, a, a buddy of ours, a co-author with Ken on his Integral Life Practice book, um, Adam Leonard, is one of the lead executive development folks at Google now. And we were just having a conversation a couple of weeks ago. And, he, and he's been having great traction lately bringing in integrally informed concepts into the executive leadership at Google framed around VUCA conditions, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous, and the idea that we need to increase our complexity of sense making in order to handle the challenges ahead. And framed that way and filtered that way, I think that integral insights and, and perspectives are invaluable. Um, but simply dumped wholesale on the table and said, build with this because it's better, um, hasn't worked out as well as it might. And, and the final piece is, you know, implicit, really one of the, cent the long tent poles of the integral argument is the growth to goodness idea. The idea that in vertical development, we end up moving up the spiral or moving up the ladder, whatever the metaphor is going to be, and that going from first tier to second tier, second tier is better. Going from, you know, the green meme to teal or purple or, you know, aqua or whatever he was calling it at the, at the last, last count is better. And there was an Im implicit idea that we become more sage-like, more enlightened, more compassionate, more of all the good pro-social things that we value as humanity. And the jury is very much out on that. The jury is, A, very much out on developmental theory as a true model. Uh, Zach Stein has been talking about, interestingly, kind of the acquisition of skills and ecosystem of self that the higher reached um, states of awareness, being, meaning making, etc., are temporary, vulnerable, dependent on environment, depending on scaffolding, that we can be up in these places at different times and different aspects of ourselves. And you can have high functioning sociopaths. You can have, you know, Nazis were infinitely more complex than Yanomamo tribesmen in the Amazon. And they didn't just make trains run on time. Right? And so the, and, and there's been research on the spread of EQ or emotional intelligence training and findings that the worst thing you can possibly do is teach EQ skills to sociopaths and psychopaths. And pickup culture, was a, you know, ha, which has weird overlaps with the integral community via some of the uh, communication dialogue processes, started out as pickup artistry. And, and so you realize that, you know, 100% use of the force gives you Yoda, and 99% use of the force gives you Darth Vader. And so I think it's really critical, back to like our humanity, is that I would take an old grandma in her rocking chair on the front porch, sharing rootsy down-home wisdom that's not complex at all, you know, over some over-cognitive asshat you know, trying to map things in tetra arising dimensions. And, and the same thing with, you know, second tier men in particular, who are so imbalanced in their embodiment and even their, um, you know, absolute lack of backbone uh, and conviction. I'd rather deal with, you know, blue, like honor, duty, courage, sacrifice, men who recognize that there is in fact something bigger than their own experience or process to live and die for. And then you're just like, hey, 
gotcha, that's awesome. Now, can we expand what it is you bow down to? Right? Can we just add the, you know, some possibility to the thing you serve versus trying to find men in, you know, men, the men from Marin, right, who are so about counting the angels on the head of a pin that their balls and their backbone are nowhere to be found and are going to take longer than we've got to grow anew. Do you have anything that you would say to Ken himself? Hmm. Well, bottom line, thank you. Thank you for living your life, expressing your Dharma, taking that badass mind of yours and using it to split atoms and map reality. You know, I think you, you've informed a generation of thinkers, beers, and doers. And I think the world is absolutely a better place for you having walked your walk and thought your thoughts uh, because of it. As I said at the beginning, the, the nature of the, the internet and the, the kind of emergent conversation is that it has to be two-way. And there is a sense with, I, I know that there's a sense within a lot of people who are following Integral, that Integral needs to be part of this conversation. It needs to be part of the, the developmental framework, for example, would really help inform the uh, intellectual dark web argument. But I think for that to happen, it would also need for Integral and Ken to be open to, to feedback and to dialogue in a way that perhaps we haven't seen so far. Do you think that they are open to that? Yeah, I mean, I haven't touched base in that world. And honestly, I mean, my sense where, where Ken lost the most relevance, other than the kind of collapse of the Integral Institute, was in the no longer going back. And I get it, like when you've got a complex thought structure and you're interested on the leading edge of your newest ideas, having to go back and reestablish all the, all the stepping stones is just a ball ache. And for him to be discussing, you know, almost glibly chakra systems or subtle energy or things that are very far off the reservation of even skeptical enthusiasts and discussing them as if they are established facts. Um, that to me is problematic. You're like, okay, you've broken with any efforts to maintain relevance to the, the middle of the bell curve, including, including someone like me who just prefers a sort of agnostic Gnosticism, who prefers a kind of rational mysticism versus taking other things on lock, stock, and barrel. The, the feedback loops I haven't seen um, can being open to it, and I think there's legitimate peevishness on his part in the same way that Jordan Peterson clearly got increasingly kind of hijacked and reactive over, you know, before and immediately after the launch of his book as he was just taking, and Sam Harris for that matter, right, just pot shots and slings and arrows and at some point you take a swipe at the ankle biters. Um, and so, you know, critiques of Ken, you know, it's the wheat from the chaff, really, like the critiques of Ken that are just inflammatory, reactionary, don't get it, caricature typecast, yeah, you know, yeah, that's a waste of time to have to sift through those if you've got actual Dharma, real work to go and do. But the considered open-hearted critiques um, have to be met with something more than you just don't understand the model or you're misinterpreting. It has to be like, okay, I've got my boat, the ship I'm steering through the water, and I've got my wake, and I don't always notice my wake. But if it's upsetting other people's boats, if it's slamming up against docks and swamping picnics, I need to take responsibility for that. And I think that that piece, um, somewhere between the non-dual and the, and the psychological, is the, is the span where Ken was actually had the least vision. And that was the messy human parts of how we get this done together and the, and, and the way we inform and are informed by each other. And where is the cutting edge of the conversation now? Where, where should people go to, if, if Integral felt like the cutting edge of the conversation in sort of 90s, 2000s, where is that cutting edge right now, do you think? Well, I mean, I think um, topically, the thing that I'm trying to track the most right now, and I think it's essential for our collective future and, one, and the least developed is 
the culture that we began mapping in Stealing Fire, but is clearly showing up in a lot of different ways around the world, and the, and the intellectual dark web is a part of it, uh, which is what is the emergence of transpersonal, collective, emergent culture? So specifically, what happens when we get together and basically connect in serial, almost like a bunch of computers, to create a collective supercomputer that is non-hierarchical. There's not one person at the top of that pyramid. And that's not flattening. That's not to say we're all going to get an you know, endless process and share our feelings. It's dynamic subordination. It is a high-functioning collaborative process. So what, does basic, what do basically ethical cults look like? You know, if you had traditional cults were, you know, like the Lucinian mysteries or the Dionysian cults or anything like that. Through history, just from an anthropological perspective, that was subjugation of self to the lineage or to the tradition. And then we ended up with culty cults, you know, which was Charles Manson and Jim Jones and potentially Andrew Cohen and some and Adi Da and some of these others. And that was subjugation of the self to the guru, who was a Ronin. They were they were not a, they were not a samurai with a dojo. They'd just taken their own claim and said, I am God realized. Um, and that was obviously wildly problematic. But we sort of re need to reclaim the original intentions. Cultus from Latin just means to worship. And what happens when we get together and worship or experience, ecstasis, peak experiences together? How do we make ethical cults where the individual is not subsumed, but actually the sovereignty of every individual is paramount? And then we collect in, we, we connect in co-creative emergence. That is a son of a bitch. And I haven't seen anybody outside of, you know, a week or two building a camp at Burning Man or, you know, high performing sports teams or special operations. I mean, the thing, the only places I've seen it have been <clears throat> temporary or explicitly performance driven, meaning their high-performing team, professional basketball or hockey or something like that, or special operations. And if you can't cut it in that game of dynamic subordination, you're out. And the next person who can is put in place. So, so to do this in egalitarian, non-hierarchical community, we live in an urban area together and we're trying to make sense of that. We are building an intentional community together and we're all in this together. Anything that doesn't mean I can just can you when you underperform? I haven't yet seen us figure that out. So for me, that's the cutting edge of this conversation is we all know enough to be dangerous. How do we get together and, and make newer, more complicated mistakes together, not repeat the old ones? That really tracks with, I guess, where, where we're at as well on the channel. People like Jordan Greenhall, yourself, Daniel Schmachtenberger. The question is, how do we create intersubject genuine intersubjective sense making? Yeah, and it's a son of a bitch. And what you said earlier about like how quickly would the aqua scene dev devolve into who's more integral than thou? Who has privileged claims, truth claims, to source, whatever the source, the subscribed source can be. And it can be aqua theory, it could be 5-MeO-DMT and the, in, in the hyperspace gods. It could be, it doesn't really matter what gets posited up there, but the moment that becomes the vehicle by which we're all supposed to gather together. We still have discernment, judgment, trade-offs, allocation of power, money, resources, sexuality, you name it, all the tribal monkey stuff. And as soon as it devolves in any way, shape, or form to a either exclusive claims of wokeness, right? I mean, and I, I have abiding and unchallengeable access to source, or it's just a shit show dogfight every time. Um, that's when any emergence collapses and we're back to game theory 101. And, and I have not seen any way around that other than potentially couples. And I, and I, and like, this is super provisional, but potentially like couples then connecting to each other and attempting to maybe do this in groups of, say, 12, you know, like 12 humans, 12 couples, not sure, but the anti, as Daniel would say, the anti-decoherence, right? The tendency of us to actually stay in it together when everything wants to fling us or drive us apart. I don't think that Burning Man culture is adequate for it. I don't think that nonviolent communication is adequate for it. I, I mean, in my own experience, Everything I've got with my partner, including decades under the bridge, growing up together, two children that we know and love and know that we would harm if we ever broke apart, 
right? A vibrant, um, personal, intimate practice together, reassert, like literally making love all the time and adding that to the tank. Like we have every reason in the world to stay in this through the hardest stuff and it still gets down to metal on metal. And there's times where it's like, fuck you, fuck this, I'm out. So knowing my own experience where like, it's like, holy shit, we have everything on our side, everything possible you know, to help us stay together. And it's still a, the liveliest ride of our lives. How, how on earth are we gonna do this at scale? Is a question I think about every day. 